Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to divide this presentation into four different sections. One, I would like to provide you with an overview about the so-called Arab Spring. I want to begin with that because that will provide us with some sort of an introduction to the three major events or rather conflicts that are taking place today. That is the Iran conflict over its nuclear weapons, certainly what's happening in Syria, and I will end up with the israeli palestinian conflict. When we call the Arab Spring, what is the Arab Spring? Most people, initially at least, dismiss it as a phenomenon, as if something is going to pass, that is going to have really not to leave any traces. But even then, you know, going back now nearly three years, we have said that the Arab Spring is not just a, a passing phenomenon. It is, in fact, it's going to be a long process, and it will take years, if not decades, before we see any kind of the real result as to what this phenomenon is all about. I think it was necessary for us to understand that the Arab Spring is manifestation awakening of the Arab youth. The Arab youth awakening was not something that anyone could defer, could delay. The technological revolution, the information revolution, had made it possible for every young man and woman throughout the Arab world to be awakened, to see what's happening around the world. And have risen to say, enough is enough. We are no longer willing to accept subjugation. We are no longer willing to live under the kind of oppression. We are no longer willing to have no opportunities, no future. What happened then in Tunisia with the one person with self-immolation who burned himself to death was sending a message, a clear message, to every single young man and woman throughout the world that we have to do something about our plight, we have to do something about our future. And these, this movement from Tunisia moved on to Libya and to Egypt, and now in Syria. And when we look at this phenomena, when, when I said to you initially, this is not a passing phenomena, because we understand and what we see exactly what is happening. And why it is so critical for us to understand that unless we carefully evaluate and carefully assess what this Arab rising, then we will be misjudging what is going to happen now in the Middle East, specifically in relation to the Israeli Palestinian conflict and the future of the State of Israel in principle. I want to establish for you the number of facts that is common to this phenomenon called the Arab Spring. We have said from day one that no matter where this uprising is going to take place, that is the, the advent of new government, be that in Egypt, be that in Tunisia, or Libya, or Syria, or Iraq, it will have a religious Islamic component. That is the religious Islamic component because Arab culture is based on Islam. It is part and parcel of their very being. And as a result, those of us specifically in the United States, the Western community, who thought it is okay to push for quick democracy, quick election, quick constitution, never understood the consequences of pushing so far for such a change as if democracy and freedom is a sort of pill you swallow it, you wake up in the morning, and now you are a free person. And what happened in Egypt is precisely that. They woke up in the morning after the, the <coughs> fall of the war. There was an election. There was presumably some kind of a constitution. And then the Muslim Brotherhood has won. It was obvious to all of us the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamic groups will be winning such an election because they're prepared. They've been preparing themselves for six, seven decades. 
the Mubarak regime of the Anwar Sadat before him did not allow secular party to rise. Did not allow secular party to organize itself into a political force. And the only party that's been organized is the Muslim Brotherhood. And exactly what was the case with the Nahda in Tunisia and what's happening now in Libya and in other places, and certainly in Iraq in the wake of the Iraq War. So there is this religious component was part and parcel, and unfortunately the United States was in the European community never considered, never understood that unless you give these parties, the secular parties, the opportunity to organize themselves, the opportunity to develop the kind of uh, political platform that will respond to the need, to the aspiration of the people themselves, there will be no real change. And so what happened in Egypt, it was only a question of time when the Egyptian people realized that here we have a new government, we have so-called freedom, but President Morsi has done nothing but consolidating his power, and instead of focusing on economic development, on giving hope, hope, he was busy trying to hold as much onto it, appointing his cronies to various high positions in government, and as a result, the Egyptian people who now know the path to the Queer Square rose again and said, we will not take it. In my view, this is not it's going to be just for Egypt. I just bring you this one single example. <coughs> because what has happened in Egypt will continue to reverberate uh, throughout the Middle East. This is a question only of when. When the other countries will be affected. Syria is an example where, again, miscalculation has taken place from day one. We have suggested long time ago that had the United States, for example, interfered some earlier. When I say interfere, mind you, I am not in favor of placing good American soldiers on Syrian soil. We have never suggested such a thing. But the United States, not to have been initially involved, it led to the disaster that we are witnessing today. As a disaster of such magnitude, I don't think anyone can describe to you in any kind of detail the horror that is taking place as we speak today. I was thinking in terms of just the number of children that were killed in, in Syria. More than 50,000 children under the age of 13. If they were to hold hands and stand up, they would come 10 miles long. And the whole world is sitting silently. I've lost its moral campus completely. And we suffered from mediocrity. And we still think that we are doing the right thing. I mention this to you because the repercussion of what happened in Syria has had direct impact on what the, how the Israelis think, what the Saudis are saying, or what other allies of the United States are thinking to say. That is, if the United States as the single power, the anchor of international stability, does not take the proper action with its allies, nobody else does. Every single other country is going to try to come and take advantage of the vacuum that the United States has created. As a result, the Obama administration has got tremendous credibility. There's a reason why the President the Prime Minister Netanyahu is questioning the motive, the credibility of the Obama administration. There's a reason why the Saudis are extraordinarily concerned as to what's going to happen. Should there be some kind of an agreement about Iran's nuclear program? There's a reason why many other allies in Europe as well are questioning whatever happened. Why is that the United States has lost its there? The Arab Spring then has come not just a, a, a revolution, but it has introduced a transformation of these current magnitudes. And I must tell you, 
God willing, we all live another 10, 15, 20, 50 years. It is going to be with us for decades to come. And hence, we are going to have to fashion a strategy. A strategy that is going to deal with all that might happen and will happen. A strategy, for example, that will address what is going to happen to the Gulf state, the Emirates and the Kingdom of Jordan, of Morocco. It is only a question of time when these two countries will all be, both of be swept by this credible revolutionary movement. And if they are all of them are allies of the United States. What should the United States be doing now in order to prevent the kind of revulsion, the disgust that has taken place in Syria? So I move to the conflict with Iran. Because it's very important to understand, to understand that in the context of what's happening as a result of the Arab Spring. Syria is not just a country that is experiencing the horror that we are witnessing today. Syria is the linchpin, a central country in the Middle East that provides and will continue to provide the basis, the foundation for Iran desire, aspiration to control a huge crescent of land from the Mediterranean to the, to the, to the, to the, to the Gulf. If you were to remove Syria from that equation, Iran will be weakened to a point it will lose any hope, any opportunity for becoming the regional hegemon that it wishes to be. In Syria, it is no longer a conflict between the rebels and the Assad regime. It has now mushroomed into much larger conflict between the Sunni and the Shia, between Saudi Arabia and Iran, between, between Qatar and Iran, between Qatar and Hezbollah, between the Gulf state and the Alawite, and between the Shia and the Sunni, like we see the slaughter in Iran going in, in, in Iraq itself. Syria has now become the battleground between the old centuries of conflict between the Sunni and the Shia. And there is going to be no end to it anytime soon. All I have to remind you is that look what's happening in Iraq. Seven years, ten years since the war. Every single day, between 30 to 50, sometimes 70 or 80 are getting killed. Sunni are killing Shia, Shia are killing Sunni. Our inability or unwillingness to intervene to put an end to, her, to the horror in Syria has also now different kind of repercussion. The repercussion that Syria is will disintegrate. It's an only question of when. Syria is no longer can be put together one piece. And this whole notion, the whole idea to have a Geneva too, and to try to put a pressure on the rebels or the government to come and try to find a political solution, is nothing but, uh, but an illusion. They may come to Geneva and they will talk, but there's going to be no solution, no political solution that is going to satisfy all the players. You need to satisfy Russia. You need to satisfy Saudi Arabia. Certainly the Assad regime. The rebels for them are 40 different kinds of groups of rebels. You need to satisfy Hezbollah and the other Gulf state. And then just assume you can find a formula to satisfy all these the players. What makes us think for a moment that the rebels are going to adhere and respect any kind of a political solution that is not going to meet their needs, their requirements, their demands. And their needs and requirements and demands are as many as you can imagine because no two groups agree with one another. And as long as the rebels continue to lose ground, as they have been losing ground for the last six, eight weeks, they will have no incentive to come to the negotiating table 
and reach an agreement because they will be negotiating from a position of weakness. For this conference to succeed, we will have to even rebalance the forces on the ground. The rebels will have to be given the kind of support, the kind of aid, the kind of equipment in order to regain some territory so that Bashar al-Assad will also understand that he does not negotiate in good faith. He will either be captured or killed. This is what he And again, let me repeat. Here again, in the United States, specifically the Obama administration has shown total and complete lack of leadership. We have abandoned for all intent and purposes one of the most important strategic spots in the world, that is the Middle East, to the winds of Russia and Putin, who has, who has jumped on every single opportunity to try to consolidate Russia's position in the absence of American This will explain now to you then why the negotiation between the five the Security Council members plus Germany with Iran raised a tremendous amount of suspicion, specifically in the mind of the Israelis, the Saudis, and others. Had they witnessed the reaction or the reaction of this administration? They have no reason to believe that the President Obama, who constantly keeps saying that America will stand behind Israel, that America will protect its allies, in fact, he is in fact going to deliver, should push come to shove. Should in fact Iran actually attain what it wishes to, and that is the acquisition of the nuclear weapon. So the negotiations have centered on a number of critical issues. I'm not suggesting to you that the President of this administration or the France or Germany, Britain, or even the Russians for that matter, matter, would be willing to make such a kind of deal that would provide Iran many openings to pursue its nuclear ambition. But the certain fundamentals, however, we need to understand here. We know that Iran has been cheating for the last 20 years. We know from very reliable intelligence, American, Israeli, and certainly British, Iran has and continues to pursue a nuclear weapon. We also know that Iran has and will continue to insist on enriching uranium on its own soil. We know that Iran has enriched more than 200 kilos of uranium over the 20% enrichment would bring it very close to creating the kind of grade necessary for nuclear weapons. We also know that Iran has installed 21,000 centrifuges, spinning day in and day out. We know all of this. This is facts that not Arab Benmir has created. This is facts known to anyone who follows the situation within Iran nuclear weapons. There is no real practical solution to the Iran nuclear program other than a peaceful diplomatic one. That is because the alternative could be disastrous. That is, if there is no resolution, peaceful one, if there is no political solution, Iran will absolutely, without any doubt, will move on with the speed to create, to have a nuclear weapon or at a minimum the ability to assemble such weapons in a very short order. Hence, the option then will be what to do. Israel will have to be faced with face the, the inevitable, that is, Iran with a nuclear weapon, should Israel will have to be forced to attack it, or what would then the United States will do? That is, no one can really tell what could be the repercussion of Iran acquiring such a weapon, it should the negotiation do not produce a peaceful result.
achieve that peaceful resolution, there's a certain requirement, certain fundamentals that must be met. And this is where you have the cleavage, the difference between the Netanyahu government and the Obama administration. You know, I, I am not Prime Minister Netanyahu, I can tell you, he exaggerates a great deal about when it comes to national security. He exaggerates, for example, really do these settlements provide more security for Israel? I think he exaggerates. I think the, when he talks about 1967 border, do they really provide but, you know, uh, removing the borders further east is going to provide better security. He can exaggerate about this, but he does not exaggerate about the concern, about the real fear when it comes to Iran potentially acquiring the terror. That is to understand the Israeli concern. But I am not sure they understand why Israel is so extraordinarily sensitive when it comes to something, something that we can maybe define as existential. For Israel, this is existential. Even, even, if we in Iran acquire such a weapon and never use it. No Israeli would want to live under the shadow of existential threat. Not now, not ever. And to suggest, why worry? Israel has 200 nuclear weapons. Iran will be stupid to take any action against Israel. Well, that is okay when you are dealing with people with reason, who can be rationalized. But if you believe, if you have this religious conviction, that perhaps the man he will never come back to earth short of apocalyptic events, then you will precipitate that. I am not telling you this is going to happen. I'm just saying, suggesting to you, the perception exists among the Israelis that we cannot take any kind of risk. And that would make it extremely difficult to reach an agreement with Iran that could satisfy the Israelis, short of, as, as Netanyahu is demanding, dismantle all the facilities, uh, not allowing Iran to reach uranium under any circumstances, ship all these 200 kilos of enriched uranium to 20% outside the country. But we also know now that some of this can take place, but probably from the Iranian perspective, they would never probably accept the fact that they cannot reach uranium on their own soil. And that it is and will continue to be a major point of contention between Israel and the United States. But does that mean there will be no political solution. Yes, there can still be. The question is, to what extent the Iran will accept very stringent monitoring system that it cannot, under any circumstances, cheat in the future. And that is where the difficulties we have today. So the base of intention with all the monitoring systems, however unfettered, however unrestricted, However open-ended it may be, Iran has had and continues to have the propensity of cheating. And then, let's, in the search for a solution, to rush for one, as they attempted to do two weeks ago, would have been a fatal mistake. Because here too, unfortunately, the Obama administration has shown tremendous weakness. Not in its desire to negotiate a solution, but by jumping. Here, Rouhani comes, and he, you know, with a charm offensive throughout, and then for the President of the United States to call him on the telephone and on his way to the airport, signifies and it sends a message to the Iranians that we here in the United States are just too eager to get some kind of a solution. Oh, again, as I said, I am in favor because there is no real practical solution other than peaceful diplomatic one. The question is, how do you go about it in order to achieve what you want to achieve and make sure that any agreement, be that interim agreement or comprehensive one, is one that is going to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, not contained. 
And this is where we are today. Soon there will be meeting again, and these issues as I described to you will be on the table. The Israelis and the Saudis and other Gulf states need to be satisfied that the agreement is one that they can actually trust very much. And that is the goal of the Amistad. If I, we move to the much easier conflict, which is the Israeli-Palestinian one. <laughs> <laughs> well, here again, you know, I'm a sort of a student of this conflict, going back now nearly all my adult life. Every time I sit down to write an article and essay on a book, I feel that I am still wallowing in this particular conflict and I cannot get out of it. I cannot get out of it perhaps because of my personal experience as a Jew, born in Iraq, lived in Israel, came to this state, studied here and there. I feel it in my system, in my blood, in my soul. I know what is happening in the region. I know the mistake that the other state have made. I know the horror, the mistake that the Palestinians have made. But I also know from first hand the mistake that the Israelis have made and continue to make. This is no longer a solution between right and wrong. This is no longer a solution of all or nothing. There must be a solution then we must seek one. Because the alternative for Israel in particular could be extraordinary dire. Let me just mention to you a number of things, and I'm sure most of you have heard about it. If the current policy of the Israeli government continues, expanding settlements, perhaps building new ones, while at the same time demanding from Mahmoud Abbas to recognize Israel as a Jewish state is nothing but an oxymoron. The, things, the two things simply do not go together. A two-state solution is not just it is the best thing to do, but it has, to come, it has come from something far more fundamental. You know, you may like it, you may dislike it, but this is the fact of life. There cannot expel 50 Palestinians, let alone 3 million. That has to happen. Which means if coexistence is a fact of life, one has now to think in terms how can we make it bearable? How can we make it tolerable? Better yet, how can we make it productive and useful? What would be the point? What will happen? if there is no solution 5, 10, 15 years down the line. I challenge anyone to tell me A, B, C can happen. I know only one thing. The Palestinians who are watching their brothers and sisters dying by the tens of thousands in Syria, who have sacrificed themselves in Egypt and elsewhere, and is continuing, they will one day wake up and say, enough is enough. I am by no means suggesting to you that the Palestinians be right and fight all of us. They have a need. But conditions have changed in the Middle East. There is a good reason for the Netanyahu government, the previous government, not to trust the Palestinians. But this is not good enough reason not to sit down in earnest and make peace today. Last week I had a, you know, part of my global leaders conversation. My guest was former Prime Minister of Israel, Ehud Khan, in Washington. As you probably recall, Ehud Khan was one Prime Minister in 2008 and 9 who conducted very serious negotiations with the, with the Palestinians. And he himself said, we have reached almost 90% agreement on 90% of the issues. And I asked him last week in Washington, tell me about it. A, what was the other 10%? <laughs> but more than that, actually. 
Why do you today say peace is a must? He said in the middle of Europe. Look at the Middle East today. Syria is in shambles. Iran is fighting to try to obtain a nuclear weapon. Hamas has actually lost its entire base, political and financial base, completely. They have no contact left with Syria. Iran is hardly able to supply them, give them any kind of money. They have lost their political support from the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And they are in a dire situation. They have never been weaker than they are today. I know he said, I know Mahmoud Abbas. Mahmoud Abbas is the last resort. The only lead Palestinian leader that can deliver. But we have to give him a, a reason to deliver. We cannot, he will not deliver on the question of Palestinian refugees. He cannot deliver on national security concern for Israel as long as Israel continues to plan, build and expand settlement in the very area where a Palestinian state should be rising. It just makes no sense. The Israelis quickly invoke the experience of Gaza. And I'm sure you heard this before. What do they say? Look what happened. We withdraw from Gaza. And all we receive is rockets. Mm. And they are absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> and that is why they are totally completely wrong. <laughs> You know, I have been, I've had tremendous experience in military intelligence, and I must tell you something. If I were to withdraw from Gaza, as Eric Sharon did, I would, I would have sat down with Mahmoud Abbas, who was then the president of over Gaza as well, and said to him, Mahmoud, let's sit down together. We want to leave Gaza. Let's make an arrangement. You will work at security. You will work at Facebook. Control. You will work at the details about every single move, and you take the time in order to build the confidence necessary. I would take two years, three years, if that's what it takes, to make so that the withdrawal is orderly, and that the Palestinians are reciprocating. For every move, every piece of withdrawal that Israel would have taken, the Palestinians would have had to take action to demonstrate that they mean. There is no other way to make to forge a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict by simply saying we don't trust them. No one make peace with between two people based on trust, based on a handshake. It's not going to happen. And it should not happen. If Israel is to withdraw from the West Bank, no one should expect the Israelis to withdraw overnight. This is precisely the mistake that Ehud Barak made when he withdrew from Northern Israel, from Lebanon. Overnight, under the cover of the night, Israeli forces were withdrawn from Lebanon. We end up with Hezbollah sitting right at the border. So when the Israelis use this experience of Gaza or Northern, they are being at best disingenuous and true. Because since we withdrew from West Bank, is inevitable under any circumstances. Then I have to sit down and find a way to formula whereby this withdrawal can be orderly and of certain phases with reciprocal act so that we make sure that we can build the confidence needed so that this agreement can be a lasting agreement. And it can be that and it should be that. And I'll tell you one other reason. For the last three and a half, four years now, on five, I should say, Israeli security forces and Palestinian security forces have been working very closely together. And I spoke to Israeli commanders who are involved in the security arrangement. And they told me in a very unequivocal term, alone, we have never seen nor believed that they are able, capable of being able to cooperate to the level that they have and to maintain the kind of security that they have been able to maintain over the last five years. How many incidents have you heard of a Palestinian attack in Israel in the last five years? You probably can count from two on one hand. I'll take questions there. I'll take questions there. <laughs> what I'm suggesting to you is not that the Palestinians are in but they also have a need to live like a human being. The 
also I need to be treated with some dignity. I now remember, I don't remember personally because I haven't heard it, but it was known. When Bingo Young was passing the rain to his successor at the time, he said, remember this, we live on a land that we have to share with our neighbors. You must treat the Palestinians with sensitivity. Or else Israel's very future will be at stake. But Israel's future at stake is not only because there is no agreement yet, but because the nature of what's happening in Israel, and this may even scale, but I want to mention to you a certain number from a demographic perspective. If you combine the Palestinian population today in the West Bank, Gaza, and Israel proper, their number would exceed the number of the Jews living in Israel. If you take in 1967, there were 119,000 Palestinians living in Israel proper. Today there are 1,700,000. Every demographer will tell you that within 30 years, 30 years, this is not too long from now, they will reach at least 45, perhaps 50 percent. That will put a name to Israel as a democracy as we know. But let me tell you about the Jews situation in Israel. The last 12 years, one million Israelis, one million, emigrated from Israel, left Israel, against which one million, twenty thousand immigrated to Israel, just hardly even. Birth rate of the Palestinian is 4.2 per woman per year. Israeli birth rate is less than 2% per woman. Less than 2 women. You don't have to be a genius. You don't even have to be a demographer to understand that from a demographic perspective, there is absolutely no prospect for Israel to remain a Jewish state. Unless it manages to have sustainable Jewish majority. Every single one of you must work, take up, get up in the morning, pack up your luggage and get you. <laughs> <laughs> and you better take your children with you and your grandchildren and every single one you can pick up. But you know that is not going to happen. You know that's not going to happen. The source of immigration to Israel by Jewish people outside Israel is limited. Is limited. And why is limited? And why Israelis themselves are living as well? Because however progressive it is, it is one of the most progressive countries in the world. Almost bar none. It's very small, it's tiny. Thousands of Israelis finish their student, their college education, and have no place to go to work. They must seek opportunities elsewhere. Just imagine, just imagine, if there were peace between Israel and Arab world. Just imagine the hundreds of thousands of Israelis that can converge all over the entire Middle East. And you create between them and the Palestinians a renaissance, the like of which the world has never seen before. I don't have bad dreams. And I don't engage in illusions. But I can tell you one thing. It is possible. It can happen. But it's going to take leadership, courageous leadership, visionary leadership, leadership among the Israelis as well as the Palestinians, to wake up and say, we are stuck with one another. If God wanted to give Israel, and this is a holy place, if God wanted to give the Jews, the Israelis, the entire land of Israel, I think God, in her wisdom, <laughs> could have said, there will be no Palestinians. But it's so good for him, there will be not a single Palestinian. And he wanted to give it to the Palestinians. I'm sure if you believe in God, God is able to do any of this. But perhaps God ordained it to be the way it is today. That is, if you are a believer, you have to accept certain reality on the ground. 
give them to challenge God. Some Israelis Orthodox community will tell you, who are we to, to say no? We who are we? This land is between to us. And I agree, I know history, and I know the Bible, and I know everything about it, and it is being the land of Israel, historically, biblically, and otherwise. But the circumstances have changed. The conditions have changed. Should we not reach out and try to reach that agreement? And let me tell you the tenets, the principle of such an agreement, is there. Ehud Barak in 2000 at Camp David almost reached an agreement. Ehud Omer reached this kind of almost reached an agreement in 2008 and 2009. There is no question. 40 settlements along the Israeli border in 1967 would remain in under Israel proper and then have 270,000 settlements. This is just a fact against the land squad. The Palestinians agreed to that. So you're not going to uproot 550,000 Israelis. The remaining 112 settlements, tiny settlements scattered all over the West Bank, have about 120,000 settlements. <coughs> and those settlers who want to live in the West Bank, they can go and live in the settlement that will remain under Israeli proper in the West Bank by agreement with the Palestinians. This is not a long dream, five dream. This is what Ehud Barak and, and Omer have negotiated. And there's an agreement to that effect. I asked him about Jerusalem. And he said to me, we agreed on Jerusalem. And the, the solution is very simple. What is Jewish is Jewish. What is Palestinian is a Palestinian. And the condition of peace is perfectly preferred for that possible. Whatever happens to Temple Mount, well, that would be under some kind of international uh, supervision. But every faith, every individual would have open ended access. This is Omer said, not Allah. Where there's a consensus among the Israelis. Jerusalem for the Palestinians has to be a capital of two states. Just as much as the Israelis cannot accept more than 10, 15, 20,000 refugees, Palestinian refugees, because Israel cannot accept any significant number of Palestinian refugees and remain a Jewish state. And the Palestinians know that. Mahmoud Abbas was asked today by the President of France, I told him, you have to be flexible on the issue of the Palestinian refugees. And he said, I am going to go based on the United, on the Arab League uh, initiative. The Arab League initiative was very simple, that is, seeking a just solution to the Palestinian refugees. It does not say they have to go back to Israel proper. It seeks just solution. A just solution means basically working out some kind of compensation, resettlement program of sort, in order, because in the final analysis, they want to go to their home then, but they don't have to go to their original home. The West Bank and Gaza, it's their homeland. They can go there and be separate, provided the means are provided for them. Ladies and gentlemen, what I am saying to you today is that after nearly 75 years of this and ending debilitating conflict, you have get to the point where you have to ask yourself a simple question. What would happen 10 years down the line? And I ask this question several Israeli leaders. And you know what? You know this fellow, his name is Naftali Bennett? Mm -hmm. He's the one who wants to annex 60% of the West Bank, of the area C. And he was asked, what do you think would be, where is there to be 10 years down the line? He said, I don't know. <coughs> Just think of this. He wants to be a prime minister. Of <laughs> you cannot, we cannot as Jews allow these reckless people and place the future destiny of the Jewish people and the state of Israel in the hands of people who are utterly and completely misguided. This is what's taking place today. 
You know, it's very easy to stand to be in the United States and cheer for Netanyahu. But we must cheer for the future of the state of Israel. Is Netanyahu and his cronies are, are in fact working, doing what they must do in order to save Israel from, its, from itself? That is really the question we have to, to ask. Israel is the only refuge that we have. The only refuge. It was created to provide the last refuge for the Jewish people, be that those that live in Israel, live in the United States, and live elsewhere. This is the symbolism of Jewish redemption. Are we prepared to risk this one single historic event after 2000, more than 2000 years? because of the blind ambitions of some people who have buried their head in the sand and are ever be willing to look up and see what is happening around. There is no reason, not one single reason, why should another Israeli boy or, or, or a Palestinian boy or child get killed in this country? Absolutely no reason. Because no matter how many more people will die on both sides, the facts on the ground will not change. They are stuck. And if you're stuck with your neighbor, and you cannot evacuate that neighbor, and he's there, and she's there, what are you going to do? You cross every now and then, you come across each other in the lobby, and the hallway. You can frown, or you can break it, but he's in your shadow. Wouldn't it be better if you said good morning, Hawaii, Hawaii? Let's have a glass of wine together, let's drink a book together. That is what comes down to. That the basic, simple, basic fact. No one should have five dreams about any other vision. There is nothing. There is no other vision. So either the Palestinians are there, and now they have must find a way to live together. You know, someone would say, and you must be kidding. Look what Hamas is saying. Look what other extremist Palestinians are saying. But you know, in the same breath, I must tell you, look what some of these suffers are saying. Some of the Orthodox Jews are saying. Not a single Palestinian go out and kill every single one of them. Why must you be paying attention to what they are saying? They are just as extremists as they can be. But you know what? I can tell you from first hand experience. He that member of Hamas, I talk to their members almost at least once a week. And they swear with, their, with the Almighty when they say, Oh wow, 80% of the Palestinians in Gaza are dying, yearning for peace they, because they have had it. They feel they are in prison, and they are in prison. Now that Egypt doesn't allow them even to have the families anymore, they are in prison, and there is no future for them. But we see in the Western world, we need much better life. But they also, the young man, just think of it. Wake up in the morning. He's been occupied all his life. His father was under occupation. And his grandfather was under occupation. Can you just imagine yourself living that way, generation after generation? Both Israelis and Palestinians have made a tragic mistake, tragic mistake by passing victimhood from one generation to the next. From the Holocaust to this day, we're passing our victimhood to every generation. And the Palestinians are doing the same. From the day of Nakba, 1948, their catastrophe. They're passing their victimhood day in and day out. And so the young men and women on both sides still live the trauma of the Holocaust or the Nakba of 1948. And that is the kind of service, that is what, how we're supposed to grow our kids, our children, to hate, to despise, to want to kill, to fear. It cannot happen. It should not happen. And it should not happen for something even greater, much more, much more uh, right, much more noble. No one. And I say to you, no one like the Jewish people. With the values that we have grown over here, with the passion that we have done, with the understanding, with the brotherhood, we sort of charted the way for what a people should be like. We, we as Jews of all people, must never adopt our moral direction, our moral compass, 
We must walk the high road of love. We must find the way. It is our duty to say that uh, don't be trusted, we cannot do anything with it. It is merely passing the victimhood to the next generation. Is that what we want? That must not be the case. I don't want my children to go and fight in the military because why should they be another war? Look at the condition today in the Middle East. People ask me, do you think this is the right time for Israel to make peace with the Palestinians, or this is the very wrong time? <clears throat> there is no perfect time to make peace. But it is the right time, because Israel has enough problems with, uh, with Syria, has enough problems with Iran, has enough problems with this whole Arab movement, Arab revolution. If it's possible to contain and make peace in the near backyard, if it's possible to quieten that conflict, Israel will be free to deal with other conflicting issues. And it's bound to serve this is the Middle East after all. So this is the right time. This is the right time, and we have Israel got to seize the opportunity. Because I honestly I don't think that Israelis should have another generation who will grow up and look at other counterparts, young, fresh Palestinians. One generation, one young Israelis, they are 10, 10, 12, 15, 16, 17, enjoying the freedom and everything they wish to have and they have and just across the street, they watch their counterpart continue to suffer. That is not what Jews have to have our protection of that. It cannot continue. Because I think we can do better, and we should do better. This is the hour, I mean, this is the time. I have never in my life, and I must tell you, 30 years I have spent my entire last 30 years on this very issue. And I have been writing and preaching so much against the Palestinians, against the Arabs, for having done so much evil and wrong things. But I too have to grow up. And I grow up. I realize that it is within our reach to change the dynamic. And it can be changed. And there is no better.